Good morning. Welcome to the Mayo Clinic Sports Medicine Hockey Webinar. I'm Dr. Michael Stewart. I'm the co-director of Mayo Clinic Sports Medicine, the chief medical and safety officer for USA Hockey. And I'm thrilled to be able to introduce you this morning to some of our hockey performance team members who will discuss preparation for hockey both during and after the season. Mayo Clinic Sports Medicine Center strives to be the best medicine center in the world. We've established ourselves as leaders in musculoskeletal injury prevention, rehabilitation, regenerative medicine, interventional ultrasound, diagnosis and treatment of sports injuries, but also performance enhancement. Our integrated and multidisciplinary team delivers the Mayo model of care to athletes to help them optimize performance, minimize the risk of injury, but also recover from injury. Our team consists of physicians, physical therapists, athletic trainers, performance coaches, strength and conditioning specialists, and a sports dietitian. Our patients and athletes are enhanced by a combination of our experienced staff but also our world-class facilities, Mayo Clinic colleagues in every discipline, and our partnership with EXOS. Mayo Clinic and EXOS apply knowledge, research, and innovation to advance human performance and help athletes perform at every level. We offer a full range of clinical services for professional athletes, but also collegiate, junior, high school, youth, and even weekend warriors. We want to enhance the body, focus the mind, and improve skills. Just to introduce you to our facilities, we have the Dan Abraham Healthy Living Center, where we are today, located on our Rochester campus. We have a hockey space, which has artificial ice and a skating treadmill. This allows us to perform skating stride analysis and perfection, shooting and stick handling skills. In addition, we have a turf space, we have a hard court, we have all the latest strength training equipment. We can drop the nets in our turf space to analyze golf swing, baseball swing with our 2D motion analysis system. In addition, we have Mayo Clinic Square, which is our facility in downtown Minneapolis. We partner with the Minnesota Timberwolves and the Minnesota Lynx at their world-class NBA and WNBA practice facility. This location also has a turf space. We have our nutrition bar. We have the same type of staff, but we also have 3T MRI, and we share some space with the Timberwolves and Lynx as well. We work closely with USA Hockey, and we're proud of some of the initiatives we've helped with to reduce the risk of injury in our sport. One is called the Heads Up, Don't Duck program. And that's where we try to teach kids to keep their heads up. If possible, hit the boards with any other part of your body except your head. But if you can't avoid head contact, keep your head up, because that will reduce the risk of cervical spine injury. This and many other programs are very important to us with our hockey performance program. Our team today for the webinar consists of Sean Vins, our hockey lead, Jennifer Noyles, EXO's Performance Director, and Luke Corey, our EXO's Nutritionist. So I want to start out with Sean. And from a skill standpoint, Sean, what should our athletes be working on after the season? So what we want to be focusing on in the off-season is improving upon the skills, improving upon any deficiencies that we maybe got caught up with, re-improving our stride through mechanics. And what we want to be able to mention through is Improving that power, that muscular endurance, speed, and overall acceleration through glide platforms. That's approximately that 100 degree knee bend or flexion through the knee, a hip, in, uh, a hip angle of around 57 degrees. That's going to help get us into a low position, making sure that each and every stride is powerful and fully extending that stride, again, to help maintain that power with each and every stride. We also want to look at stride recovery. So when we're recovering that foot back, enabling us to hold that single leg glide platform is crucial in making that next step and carrying that speed throughout the stride. It's also a time to look at our shooting and our puck handling. 
when we're looking at our puck handling, we want to make sure that we're instilling that top hand control mentality, letting that blade cup the puck in the forehand on the backhand with that top hand, and that bottom hand is more of a guide, having a looser grip there on that bottom harsh portion of your stick, allowing for control, maneuvers left to right, small area spaces, control. And then when we're thinking about all of our shooting, we want to make sure that we're shooting all different types of shots. We don't want to just practice the shots we're good at, not just forehand, not just the fun booming slap shot. We want to practice shots from in close, in tight to the net, pulling the puck off of the wall, uh, doing things where we can maybe practice in the garage, maybe uh, tipping pucks, um, working different types of shots that way. Uh, if you can, we would love to have you on your skates, keeping the, the, the the, the, the arena the same, the stick length the same, uh, but we know that's not always an opportunity. Uh, for us here in center, we, we have our beautiful synthetic ice and our skating treadmill to help kind of provide some of those uh, mechanics from the skating perspective and from the shooting and puck handling perspective. That's great. An accurate and hard backhand shot is quite a weapon for a hockey player. Uh, always, every time. Definitely need to work on that. Jenny, what about performance type training during the off season? Yeah, I, I think that's probably the most you know common question, whether it's from an athlete or a parent, is when when should I start hitting the gym again? Um, again, it's really important. Your your off season, depending on the sport, if we look at hockey specifically, you actually have quite a bit of time. Really, if we were to look at your off season from that thirty thousand foot view, really what we're trying to do globally within that off season is really try to reset, rebuild, build the foundation get bigger, faster, stronger. Um, that's the 30,000 foot view. But again, responsibly, if I have an athlete that comes to me, first and foremost, you need to celebrate the season, take some time off. Um, immediately, if you've had an in-season injury or if there's something that's been nagging you shortly after the season ends, it's really important that you make sure that you see the right expert to make sure um, it isn't something that, that's critical. Because, uh, again, we've just learned if, if you leave things over time, they don't necessarily get better unless you address them. So I just really encourage people that have just ended their season, if you have some aches or pains or something that's just reminiscent or re remaining from the season, to really go see your physician or see your physical therapist um, and get that checked out. Um, so, again, once you've had some time to rest, recoup, do some of the things that you enjoy to do uh, outside of playing hockey, um, again, we're trying to reset and rebuild. Uh, all of us have you know, things personal to us. For me, I might have a tight shoulder. I might have a tight hip. That just might be me, myself, as an individual. Everyone's going to have some kind of movement compensation. Uh, sometimes sport can exaggerate that. And so really, you need a baseline to start your off season of how am I moving? Do I have some injuries uh, or compensations that I need to address? You know, secondly, we also want to look at what, what's your work capacity. So a lot of the times when we have our athletes come in, we're trying to set the base, set the guidelines, set the roadmap. We need to know where you're starting. Uh, so not just from a movement profiling perspective, but just from your cardiovascular system. We often will do submax VO2 testing with our athletes to see from an energy system development perspective, where are you to date? Where do you as a hockey player need to be three months from now? Um, in addition to that, we always like to do you know, some of our global strength and power training. Again, we don't train just to improve those numbers, but really any kind of testing, there needs to be meaning behind it. We're not just looking at those numbers. We want to look at how those numbers are going to help build the prescription or the roadmap for your, for your off-season training. Um, outside of that, too, sometimes we get really carried away with just, you know, finding those baselines, finding those metrics, where it's also a really good time at the beginning of the off-season to reflect on you know, how was your performance in season? What are some of the things that you want to achieve? What do you want to do different? Um, and that's definitely something you should be having a conversation with your coach, if you're a high school athlete, and I know there's rules and restrictions about how much contact you can have with your, your coaches. So we definitely can be a resource of, hey, you know, from a skills perspective, I want to do this, this, and this. From a performance perspective, I can then evaluate and say, hey, if, if this is your goal, this is how you know, our performance training can help you reach those goals. Um, so it's really important to help set those expectations, set those goals, and then ultimately create the roadmap. So that's relatively early on in your off season. Otherwise, you're going to walk around aimlessly, not necessarily being on the right path. And before you know it, the season's going to be here. Um, 
but once we've done those baselines, we know how long we have to work with you, or if you're working with another individual, you're always counting backwards to see how many weeks and sessions you have, and then it's putting in the work. I mean, whether it's your strength training, your cardiovascular work, or even just from an injury prevention perspective, everything's a skill. It just doesn't happen overnight. So if, if you have tight hamstrings, you're going to have to spend time improving that stiffness or tightness, that mobility, that strength. Um, often, we're as human beings, we're really good at doing what we want to do, uh, where sometimes our job is to tell individuals, hey, we have to look at this whole system of performance training, from the injury prevention, from the soft tissue, to the strength, the power, energy system development, and really come up with a, a robust plan that's responsible, and at the end of the day, has those benchmarks so we know you're improving. So. That's great advice, and I think that uh, we should promote postseason checks by athletes because oftentimes injuries will linger and if you diagnose the injury and treat it it will get better in addition as you mentioned you can pick up some of these asymmetries which will prevent an injury the following season so that's why we look at epidemiology of injury research and we know that in hockey for example the groin and the hip are often an issue with overuse injuries the shoulder with acute injuries so Joe Aishin and our other physical therapists can pick up problems, correct them, and then prevent injuries into the future. In addition, I think that it's very important to have that period of rest. And so many of our athletes are motivated and, and we, we love that, we respect it, but rest is a very important part of training, rest and recovery. And so oftentimes we have to prescribe that because otherwise they'll overtrain. So next is nutrition. This is an area which is often neglected. Uh, maybe we'll talk later about the pregame meal, but nutrition for a hockey player is a year-round commitment. So maybe, Luke, you could talk to us a little bit about off-season nutrition. Yeah, absolutely. So I think Jenny hit the nail on the head talking about a lot of hockey players postseason having a lot of bumps and bruises and even major injuries that they need to recover from. And your nutrition is going to help facilitate that re recovery and regeneration. So if we look at specific nutrients, the ones that help with regeneration are the ones that are have anti-inflammatory properties. So things like omega-3 um, fatty acids that come from things like salmon and tuna, those fatty fishes, olive oil, nuts and seeds like almonds and walnuts and pumpkin seeds, um, things like avocados. A lot of these foods that young athletes don't eat are the ones that we want them to include in their diets, especially in the off-season when they do need to start that recovery process. Um, a lot of other uh, nutrients that we are looking for are things that come from different um, herbs and spices. So uh, turmeric is a, has a great anti-inflammatory property. Things like cinnamon and garlic and curry powder, these particular spices help with that recovery and regeneration process. Um, we also need to think about rebuilding muscle and different tissues as well. We take a beating during the hockey season so we're basically breaking our, our bodies have been broken down at that point. So we really need those high quality proteins to help rebuild um, our bodies. And those come from things like chicken and turkey and fish, lean cuts of beef, eggs, beans, lentils, the whole sort of wide variety of those uh, protein sources. Um, and then we really need to think about getting those fruits and vegetables in our diet. Again, a, a category that a lot of young athletes neglect is their fruit and vegetable consumption. But these foods are like the glue that holds everything together. Right? So we want to make sure we're getting uh, enough fruits and vegetables in our diet on a daily basis to help um, just facilitate that entire uh, recovery and regeneration process. Once we've gotten over those, those injuries and we're starting to feel good again, a lot of athletes start to hit the gym. Um, many of them want to put on some lean muscle mass in the off season. So at that point, you know, the focus does shift to um, those high quality proteins that I just mentioned. We also want to bring in a lot of those complex carbohydrates. That's like the fuel for your muscle. So whenever we're working out in the gym, we want to make sure we have enough fuel to support that muscle growth. And so we're talking about things like whole grain, um, bread, pasta, brown rice, quinoa, oatmeal, granola, those sorts of complex carbohydrates that provide our body with that fuel. And then the last piece of the puzzle, um, another area that um, a lot of people neglect, is our hydration. Um, I know hydration is absolutely important during the season, but it's equally important in the off season as well. So minimally, we want to be drinking at least half of our body weight 
in ounces of water every day. And I emphasize water. We really don't need a lot of those other fluid sources. You don't need a whole lot of juice or pop or energy drinks or things like that, and especially not alcohol. Uh, we want to focus on, on water intake to, to maintain that hydration. Um, so the easiest way to incorporate um, those strategies, strategies into our diet are to establish uh, a, a good eating routine. And what I mean by that is get into a, a, a consistency and routine of starting your day off with a good quality breakfast, following that up with high quality snacks throughout the day, balanced meals, and getting your proper hydration. Doing all those things will certainly help with the recovery after a long season, but also set you up for success entering into the next season. Excellent. Yeah, a few years ago, the carbohydrates were looked down upon, but we realized what an important source it is for energy for our athletes, and so you have to incorporate those complex carbohydrates in your diet. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's a nice synopsis and a lot of good advice about off-season. What about during the hockey season? For example, from a skill standpoint, other than practices and games, what should we be focusing on during the season? Well, we know we have a reduced time that we're able to dedicate to some of those specific skills. We still want to be looking at our skating, still want to be looking at our shooting, still want to be looking at our puck handling skills. Now, that does change. We're in the off season. You know, our puck handling, our shooting is that more four or five times a week, looking at quantity or quality there uh, versus that quantity. Where in the in season, we start looking at how can I take more shots? How can I now go and practice shots that I'm not practicing all the time? during practice, but I have a lot of opportunities during games uh, to take that shot. We want to start practicing some of those. A really good way to do that is try to get into some of the, the goalie camps that might be going around. Or if your specific team has any goalie sessions or practices that take place right before practice, it's an excellent time to start going and just volunteering as a shooter, getting a lot of good repetition, but able to practice some shots that you know that are not only pertinent to that goaltender see a lot and trying to, uh, to try and make those saves, but gives you an opportunity as a as a scorer now to not only be getting that goal every few games to maybe getting a goal a night. Um, and from a, st a stick handling perspective, uh, we want to make sure that we start looking at puck handling maybe before practice, puck handling after practice, that, that's all going to be kind of done in the locker room, in the garage, in your basement. Uh, and like we mentioned before, where you want to try to be on your skates, that's maybe not an opportunity we're able to do that, but it's a great way to start warming up the hands. Uh, and then also doing some skill work, spending some extra time before and after practice with some specific skill things with the puck handling. Work on little maneuvers, doing one-on-one -on -one, uh, moves, not just through a, a, a straight linear pattern down the ice and in a traditional one-on-one -on -one that you might see in a practice, but maneuvering out of the corner, thinking about that small space and what opportunities you have as a player to maybe put that puck through the legs. Is it a spin move that takes you out of it or reading a read and react play with a give and go, uh, maybe with some of your line mates uh, or other power play players? From a skating perspective, uh, this is a great opportunity to take advantage of a skating treadmill. Uh, you don't have to be in that full equipment. You really get to focus on some very specific uh, portions of that skating with your power, with your overall acceleration, uh, with some of that muscular endurance, you're able to take advantage of that while utilizing the skating treadmill and make sure that our technique is where we want. Now, if you don't have access to a skating treadmill, a really good way is just spend 20, 20 minutes. Um, again, this is going to be something that's going to have to come before or after practice. Uh, or if you're, you're in one of the great states like Minnesota for hockey, take advantage of the outdoor rink and just go and practice some of that really good mechanics, long extensions, staying low in your glide platform, recovering that foot back to the middle, making sure you're staying with that foot forward to maintain that glide, that speed throughout your stride. Now, this doesn't have to be a very grueling 20-minute session but we're thinking about maintenance. During the season, we're thinking about maintenance, so they don't have to be this grueling power skating session uh, that you might see more in the summertime. No wonder we can't get players off the ice. They're coming early and staying late to work on all those things that you talked about, especially shooting at the goalies, which is mutually beneficial. So Jenny, should performance training stop during the season, or should we be doing more exercise? No, that, that, that's a really good question. I think. You know, historically, often we we separate 
all right, well, now I'm doing my thing, I'm, I'm doing my sport, and that's all I'm going to focus on. Um, I've done all this really great work in the off season. Um, I'm going to forget about it. And really, our message is there's definitely an emphasis on the playing, focusing on the skill work. If you're trying to improve a shot, just like Sean said, at the end of the day, your responsibility is to your, your team to show up to practice, be ready for practice, perform your best at your games. Um, but again, you've just spent maybe 12 to you know, 16 weeks, depending on when your season starts, putting a lot of work in um, and really developing what we call a, a performance lifestyle, right? So really the challenge is in your in-season, even though that emphasis is playing the sport, doing your best as a team, you don't want to forget about all those best practices of, just like Luke said, creating that routine for nutrition. Don't forget that dynamic warm-up. Don't forget to incorporate your, you know, flexibility, mobility type work. Um, those are the kind of things that if you do a little bit every single day, it's going to add. It's going to add up. So you've done maybe a 15 to 20 minute dynamic warm up in the summertime. That's accumulated to hours and hours. You know, your body, your tissue, everything is benefited from that. Um, we still want the same in season, right? Because at the end of the day, we want you performing at your best. We want you to, to make sure that you know you stay healthy, and a lot of that is staying with those 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 strategies. So from the dynamic warm up, still doing your what we call your pillar preparation or those corrective type interventions. Because if you had any type of movement compensation or asymmetry, um, most sports kind of encourage those, right? So again, during the season, we want to make sure that we're ahead of those type of compensation. So what happens if you're always in a flex position or an extended position? The way you move your body is the way it's going to form and it's going to adapt. Um, so wherever we can control those things to help you know, decrease the risk of injury, we're always encouraging that. So again, sticking with that dynamic warm-up, making sure you're doing your pillar prep preparation, corrective type interventions. Um, meet a meet and talk to a lot of both professional and junior hockey level athletes where they feel that their strength you know stays you know relatively you know consistent uh, really the only way to achieve that is still putting time in in the weight room again maybe in the summertime your strength sessions might have been 60 minutes you know we're not articulating that you have to do hours and hours of it but do your best, be efficient, still make sure you hit the, the major muscle groups, upper body, total body, lower body. You can do some complexing there. Um, again, we want to make sure that you're maintaining that, that strength and power. Um, sometimes, too, we have to look at from an energy system development. If you're someone that doesn't get a lot of playing time, and then mid-season, you look at the bench of individuals, and you, you now have the opportunity to play some more. Um, it's also looking at, realistically, how much are you putting in as one of the, the team members and to stay healthy, to, to be ready to shine when it's your time to get called up, uh, making sure that, again, you're still doing your energy system development uh, type work. Um, probably most importantly, as you, you know, reminded me, um, often we think of regeneration recovery as something completely separate, whereas for us, you have to periodize it. Just as I have, you know, I know how many days my athletes are training with me, I know how equally how many days they're recovering. Because, again, we look at it from a total system, we have to make sure that, you know, from A to B, we're putting the work in, but we're also recovering from it. Um, and listen to your bodies. Uh, I know sometimes that can be difficult because there is that, that sense of urgency to, well, I just want to play. I'm not going to tell anyone how I'm feeling. Uh, just really encourage you guys to be truthful with yourselves. Just like Dr. Stewart said, if, if, you, if something's going on that seems minor, if you leave it, um, unless you address it, it's not, it's not going to get better. So... So yeah, so keep good practices, continue to carry on with the strategies you learned in the summertime in season, and we look forward to when you come back uh, in the off season. Well, I think that's great suggestions for injury prevention, uh, especially we want our athletes to be honest with themselves, with their parents, with their coaches, with their physician, their athletic trainer. If you hide an injury, it'll actually take you longer to recover. But if we can make a focused diagnosis and start treatment sooner, we can get you back on the ice quicker. In addition, during the season, you have to make sure you have high quality, well fit equipment, especially helmet, mouth guard, elbow pads. You should take assessment of that before the season to make sure that you're prepared. 
Also, we need to learn on ice awareness and body control skills. We need to learn how to give and take a check. Contact is part of the sport, whether it's a non-checking or a checking league. And I think we also have to remember sportsmanship and mutual respect. We should never put ourselves or an opponent in a vulnerable position that could cause injury. So never check from behind. Never use your head as a weapon. Never hit somebody else in the head. Those are very dangerous activities, and we owe it to ourselves and others to play the sport with integrity. So in, in the addition, like, like Jenny said, it's important to maintain those same hip flexibility and strength and, and shoulder and pillar and core so it really doesn't stop during the season. It might be modified a bit, but it's a year-round endeavor. What about nutrition during the season? How does that change? What are some important points pre-game, post-game, for example? Yeah, well, I mean, you guys already hit on the theme of maintenance. Um, you know, these hockey players that put in all this work in the offseason with their training and their skills work and also their nutrition, we want them to maintain that um, throughout, their, their, throughout their season during the wintertime. Um, the only modification, really, is that need for fuel. Right, um, a lot of these hockey players are probably playing or practicing four, five, six times a week. Um, they're burning through a lot of energy. We want to make sure that they're able to sustain that energy um, throughout their games and practices. And that's where those co complex carbohydrates really um, come into play. So including those pre-game, post-game, basically with every meal you want to be including um, a high quality carbohydrate source in addition to those proteins that we already talked about those healthy fats, and your fruits and vegetables. We really want to maintain that balanced meal, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacking on high-quality foods in between, and also getting enough, enough hydration. Um, the one topic that gets brought up a lot is also supplementation. Um, I see a lot of athletes who are taking all sorts of supplements from protein powders to creatine to pre-workouts and so on. Um, Whenever supplementation is being considered, what we want to make sure is that these athletes have a good diet in place. Uh, supplements work best when uh, the athlete has already established good eating habits, and they're really just there to fill in uh, any potential gaps. Saying that, if you are to consider a supplement, always do your research first. Don't just blindly take a supplement because your teammate takes it or a friend at school takes it. Do your research, figure out whether this is something you actually need. Um, Talk to an expert like myself, and then if you are going to go and purchase something, find the highest quality product that you can. There is um, a lot of junk on the market when it comes to supplementation. It's an unregulated uh, market, and so we want to make sure that if you are going to be taking some of these things, that they're of the highest quality. Um, I've already touched on the hydration. That's especially important during a game. Um, so drinking enough water pre-game, but during a game, every break, making sure you're uh, having a sip of water from your water bottle, and then continuing that uh, post game as well. I think you made a good point about the supplements. You know, as the International Ice Hockey Federation medical supervisor, I actually do the doping control at World Championships, and as a team physician, oftentimes have to counsel my athletes about supplements. So I think that's excellent advice to make sure that you understand what you're putting in your body, and that means high quality supplements that are NSF certified or from these groups that actually do their homework because many over-the-counter supplements contain ingredients that aren't on the label and ignorance is not an alibi plus we don't want somebody taking something that could be detrimental. Yeah, and one more thing that I forgot to mention was the whole concept of recovery and nutrition so after an intense game of practice we want to start that recovery and rebuilding process um, and this is where a lot of supp supplements do come in at this point, the protein powders and things like that, part of like a uh, post-workout shake um, most athletes don't necessarily need a supplement post-workout. We can get the nutrients that we need simply by making a homemade shake for ourselves using fruit, Greek yogurt, you know, a protein source like milk or soy milk, something like that. Um, that's going to give us all the nutrients to help us rebuild and recover and get ready for you know, the practice or game the next day. Excellent. So can I interject? Yeah, absolutely, Sorry, Jenny. Go ahead. You know, Luke, again, just made me think of something, you know, talking about just recovery, you know, regeneration. Um, so definitely at the pro elite level, you know, with just the new craze is just fatigue science, like truly understanding, you know, if that individual, what is their readiness to train? Um, not just from a mindset perspective, but just even from a physiological perspective, a heart rate, 
um, perspective. So there's a lot of really neat things going on in the research and what's being done you know, at the pro elite level and even the collegiate level. Um, and so it's one thing I always think about what my parents always told me, if something down is going to happen. So what I'm getting at here is if you are a youth athlete at the high school level and you're not necessarily you know, have the advantage of, of having someone probe you or, or check your, your levels and, and hormone levels to see if you're, you're ready to train, it's, it's really important to write down how you're feeling. Um, and again, that's not, hey, are you happy or are you sad? I mean, it could be for some individuals, but you know, how many hours of sleep did you get? How restful was that sleep? You know, just looking at, you know, how does your body feel? So again, having those subjective type measures, because if you do that over a period of time, you're going to start to see trends, not just, hey, I'm just going to power through this and realizing a month down the road, you know what, I actually found out I had mono. Um, you know, so I think it's really important for the youth and high school athlete and even at the professional level to be a little bit more introspective and re reflective on really how are you feeling. There's a lot of really interesting readiness to train type surveys that are accessible online to individuals. So if this isn't something that you're currently doing, I strongly recommend that um, even the parents watching for themselves, it's just really valuable information. That's excellent. Fatigue science to me is fascinating. And there's been some research in the National Hockey League with teams showing how lack of sleep actually affects performance. Mm -hmm. So it's a good idea to keep track of that. We want to leave time for some of your questions, and if we don't get to all of them, we'll try to answer them later. But first, I'd like to ask each of our team members to give us their final thoughts or some take-home points mm -hmm. that you can uh, use throughout the season and after the season. Sean? Well, what we want to make sure, first and foremost, is we're dedicated to our program, whether that be off-season or in-season. We're setting aside time, setting goals for ourselves, uh, as we've mentioned, um, and consistency, making sure that that plan is followed through. Uh, if you're really, really pressed for time with power skating, with trying to improve some of those stride mechanics, getting a lot of that platform strength from your strength and conditioning program, uh, you'll be able to achieve there. But if you're really pressed for time, like I said, think about focusing on skill work, your puck handling, and edge work. Jenny? Yeah, you know, I would say, you know, first and foremost, I always emphasize, you know, whatever you do, you know, have, have fun doing it. I mean, when you look at, you know, some of the professional athletes we've had the great opportunity to work with, they love what they do. Uh, we really want to make sure, you know, if you're going to spend hours and hours, you know, putting in the prep work, um, you know, make sure you're getting the work done, but have fun, fun doing it. Um, I think, you know, for us, just, you know, simply if we had a motto, every day is game day. And again, that mainly resonates with people in season. We're really, again, what we're challenging yourselves, your family, the, the people that are supporting you in your human performance, your hockey performance, um, just treat every day like game day. So you have those routines from the minute you wake up to what you're putting into your mouth to the warm-up you do pre-rank or pre-practice. You just really want to make sure that you're maintaining those, those strategies you know, throughout, throughout the day, throughout the season. And I promise you, uh, when you come back in the off-season, hopefully you've had a few less injuries and you felt, felt good throughout the season. So again, have, have fun with it and just maintain that, maintain that uh, strategy. Luke, yeah, nutritionally, um, great performances are really built on a foundation of good nutrition. So that's why it's very critical, especially in the off season, to develop those good eating habits um, and then maintaining and modifying that as you enter into the season. And that will ultimately elevate the performance of, of any athlete. And just to reiterate what I, what I mentioned before, that always starts with a good quality breakfast, um, following that up with high quality snacks and balanced meals making sure you're getting enough hydration, and then if you are to supplement, supplement wisely, um, do your research, talk to an expert. Once you're doing all of those things, um, the only thing holding you back would be potentially your training program or, or anything else. Uh, when your nutrition is in place, ultimately your performances are going to um, elevate. Yeah. Well, as a hockey fan and a hockey researcher and a hockey doctor and a hockey dad, uh, I've had four children who have played collegiate and professional ice hockey, and I think that preparation and a collaborative approach is critical. And so you have to train hard, but you have to train smart. And I think that's what you've learned here this morning. We need to have hockey-specific conditioning of the body and the mind 
in order to achieve the highest level and to have the most fun. I can't emphasize enough the need for mutual respect for your opponent and also officials. And you should have fun, like Jenny said. Hockey is an incredible sport, and it should be fun. We'd now like to take some questions. I like this first one because I think it raises some very important points. Somebody writes that their son fractured their tibia during a hockey game. The tibia is the shin bone, which obviously keeps them off the ice for a while. What things can be done to get back in the game? He also plays baseball. So what's some advice? And what, what that means to me is I have these wonderful colleagues who not only enhance hockey performance, but we utilize their skills when somebody gets injured. So this young man who fractured his tibia can follow these same principles, can be working on core and pillar strength, can be working on aerobic and anaerobic conditioning, upper body strength, cognitive training, check his nutritional requirements, not only to heal his tibia fracture, but to make him a better hockey player. Then we've had the opportunity with our skating treadmill, artificial ice, a very controlled environment with a harness. We have an Alter G anti gravity treadmill. I'd like to see him on our treadmill actually walking, running, and eventually skating well before he would normally get back on the ice. So it's a wonderful opportunity for us to translate our hockey performance program to injury recovery and surgical rehabilitation. Next is, what about energy drinks or sports drinks in general? Do players need Gatorade, Powerade? Is water enough? What's your recommendations about more expensive drinks? Yeah, absolutely. Um, straight up answer is that a lot of players uh, abuse these products, uh, especially energy drinks. Um, they're completely unnecessary if you've got a good diet in place. A lot of people utilize these, these drinks to compensate for a poor diet. The foods they're eating just aren't giving them the energy that they require, and so they are turning to energy drinks and things like that. When it comes to sports drinks, again, it's another product that is overconsumed. I've seen athletes carrying a bottle of Gatorade around with them from the start of the morning to the end of their day, just constantly sipping on them throughout the day, and they might be actually oversaturating their system. Um, water alone is enough to meet your hydration needs. A sports drink. If there's, any, if there's ever a time to use it, it's basically during a game. Um, you don't need it before. You don't need it after. You only need it for its fuel and electrolyte components, and you'd only need that when you are training. Excellent. This is another good question because I've noticed in my own children during the off-season, some like to skate right away. We can barely get them off the ice. Others don't skate for a few months or a couple months. They just do their dry land training. How much should we be skating during an off-season? I guess it depends upon how much you skated during the season. If you make it to the Stanley Cup Finals, maybe you should get out of your skates for a little while. That's right. You know, as, as Jenny mentioned earlier, uh, for any athlete, whether we're the youth athlete or we've gone all the way to the Stanley Cup Finals, we want to take some time away from the sport that we love so much um, and do some other things. But as far as how much we're skating, you know, for that youth athlete, we're looking somewhere around that two to four times a week. Um, and for a high school athlete, we're looking more of, of a, a four to six times. Um, and again, it, it's a little bit dependent upon how much work we have to do, how comfortable we are, how long our seasons are. Uh, it's different if we've played 30 games versus the 80 to 100 games. Uh, it's, a, it's a very different look and how much on ice uh, time that we've actually had. Uh, but always remembering uh, to look at some of the specific windows uh, for, age, for, for age when looking at some of those training uh, and on ice times is we don't want to overdo it. We still want to maintain that recovery throughout that off season. And I think to, to add to that, you know, one of the, I learn a lot from my athletes, you know, and learning a lot just from the professional, not just hockey players, but baseball players. Um, what they've identified is, you know, your body's not going to interpret, hey, I've just spent an hour doing X in the weight room with Jenny, and now I just did X, you know, amount of hours with, say, Sean on the synthetic ice or in the rink. Um, your body's really going to look at it as the total amount of work. So sometimes the conversations that I'm having with a youth parent, a high school parent, or even some of the professional athletes is, for us, the benefit of working in this integrated approach is I know exactly what Sean's doing. He knows exactly what 
what I'm doing. We work, you know, we have some really good relationships with the local hockey coaches here. Because again, sometimes there's a point where it's not necessarily too much of the skating or too much of the performance. It's what is it together in all totality. Um, and that's why really early on, at any level with the youth and you know, professional hockey player, we're having those conversations on, for you specifically, when do you like to start skating? All right, let's look work backwards. Here's where you came in. Here are those benchmarks again. Here's your desire. All right, let's plan this accordingly so that you're not showing up at camp already having peaked and then um, going downhill from there. Because again, our last thing is for someone to show up to training camp overtrained because yeah. then we haven't done we haven't done our job either with what we're doing or most importantly how we're communicating and educating. So dryland training is important for a hockey player, but how does dryland training apply to the ice? For example, change of direction, agility, speed. Can we utilize the dryland training to make us more effective on the ice? You know, absolutely. I think the you know the the sexy word in sports is power, right? Power is force times velocity. To really truly express power, there's there's certain fundamental. Uh, blocks that you need. Are you stable? Are you injury free? How good are you at absorbing force? How good are you creating that force? The benefit of doing that type of work on dry land is we're training the energy system, we're training the muscle, we're training that response. Um, nothing beats. If you want to skate fast, you, you have to skate and you have to skate fast. And so again, we're trying to supplement and also augment what Sean is doing in the synthetic ice space, or what you're doing with your with your coaches uh, in the rink. Uh, so again, from an energy system development, from a muscle, you know, being able to absorb and then transfer force, making sure that the core or the pillar can transfer that force. Those are all things, and probably most importantly, it's just body awareness, right? That that can be taught and trained dry land as much as it can be on the synthetic ice space. But you're you're kidding yourself if you think you can not play hockey and just do dry land. You, again, it's really important that you have a balance of, of both. Additionally, I think to that, you want to make sure that you're not just training overall speed. Mm -hmm. uh, not very often are we just skating from one end to the other, or even skating just from blue line to blue line. Hockey is a game of transitions. That power, that agility, being able to load the system properly and transition with power and get that first step, get us up to full speed within that first three to five steps is very, very important and crucial to a hockey player. Right. Good example of sports-specific conditioning. Right. So one of our listeners or maybe one of their children is a three-sport athlete, mm -hmm. and we promote playing multiple sports, especially for our youth. So if you are a three-sport athlete, when do you find time to rest? And what are some strategies that we can provide which will allow that recovery that we talked about? Right. Um, you know, so I'll, I'll take this one first. Uh, I think uh, especially the youth or high school athlete that's, that's playing or doing free sports, um, obviously they're a go-getter. Uh, they love sport. Chances are they like to please people, right? So how do I keep my, say, football coach happy, my basketball coach happy? my hockey coach happy, I'm going to show up to every practice, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Um, and really, we can empower the athlete, educate them on, on what to do to stay healthy. You know, for us, if I have a three-sport athlete who at the moment is at an intersection of like two different sports in season, responsibly, I'll tell that parent, you know what your son or daughter needs is, is potentially less of me Maybe from my perspective on the dry land performance side, I need your son and daughter to recover. Um, so again, outside of providing the education to the athlete, I really think it, it lies more in the responsibility of us as the, the providers, the coaches, that we know the, these are good kids, right? There's a lot, a lot of them are gonna play multiple sports. Eventually they're gonna have to make the decision to, uh, you know, if they wanna continue to play hockey and they wanna go on to that next level, um, to really spend the time doing it and recognizing that uh, you really, as this whole webinar suggested, is we're trying to create really good, healthy lifestyles and strategies. So one, one more basketball practice, that might be awesome, but if it was in place of, say, the, the needed recovery or the needed fueling that you need, you're not doing yourself 
any good, you're not doing your coaches, your teammates any good, even though in your mindset, well, well, I did a lot, like I went to all the practices, what's happening? We just have to really make sure from a mindset, nutrition, movement, and recovery perspective, we're really respecting all those, those performance pillars. Um, and that's true whether you're a three-sport athlete, a two-sport athlete, or one-sport athlete. But um, I also think it, it, you know, as kids get older, the light bulb starts to go on. I need to start making decisions. And I think, again, for us, the professionals, and even, you know, as parents, uh, being able to have that conversation with the athlete saying, when, when is too much too much? You know, your grades are slipping, you look tired, or this or this. Uh, so, again, it's, it's a difficult one, but it's an important conversation to have. Um, especially if you're noticing that someone's not recovering um, or they're getting getting injured. Yeah. The question about concussion prevention in ice hockey, which is very pertinent. It is a contact sport. There is risk in all sport, even in free play, bicycling, skateboarding for concussion. In hockey, there's some things that we can recommend. First of all, we know concussions occur from a blow to the head or an unanticipated collision, often an open ice collision, where there's a whiplash effect which, if, which can uh, cause a traumatic brain injury. So we want to reduce blows to the head, and that comes from this body control, body awareness, the sportsmanship. Helmets are important. We can't underemphasize the importance of a helmet. Uh, however, they don't really prevent concussions. They might prevent more serious injury like skull fracture. So make sure you have a well-fit, high-quality helmet. Make sure it's strapped firmly through a chin cup, hopefully with a full face mask. The other thing that can be helpful, though, and there's not a whole lot of science on this, but it makes sense, which is neck strengthening. So if you have an open ice collision and your neck muscles react quickly and they're strong and you're wearing a mouthpiece that has an impenetrable bite plate, you can prepare yourself for the hit and probably reduce the risk of concussion. So should neck strengthening be part of our off-season training program? And what are some tips on how to strengthen the neck muscles? Yeah, I think absolutely. That is uh, strengthening the neck mu neck muscles is going to, like you mentioned, going to help prevent and, and allow you to kind of bear down and, and soften that blow for yourself. Um, doing things um, such as, as some neck neck lifts, but also doing some some stretching with the neck, making sure that you're prepared each and every training session, doing some of the soft tissue work uh, that we do every time with our athletes through mobility, uh, but also using movements such as uh, some Olympic lifting, building up the, the upper traps there as well. That's all supporting that neck strength. And I, and I would say um, this isn't a license for all you youth athletes to go out there and YouTube these exercises. It's Again, just as Dr. Stewart said, your neck strength is critically important in injury prevention on ice, but equally so, the last thing we want is all of a sudden to have a slew of athletes in here that, that did an incorrect movement or loaded their neck actually too, too heavy. So again, um, just like anything, if you don't have the opportunity to come and see us here, there's wonderful, wonderful experts that you can find in your community that can provide you with the correct movements, the correct exercises, the correct loading. Uh, so when in doubt, seek that advice. There's a question about what are the most common injuries you see in a hockey athlete? Does it change depending on the level of play? It certainly does. And so we've done research in Mayo Clinic Sports Medicine on hockey injuries. Actually, at the youth level, especially when we're looking at our termites and squirts, it is a very, very safe sport. They're well protected, and uh, we don't see too many injuries, maybe a few contusions, which are bruises or minor injuries. As you progress through the level, it becomes more risky. Players get bigger, stronger, faster. The game takes on a little more risk. And there are a lot of things you can do to prevent those injuries. We mentioned earlier the most common soft tissue injuries are usually due to overuse. Could be something wrong with your skating stride, uh, asymmetry between the two limbs, for example, uh, weak muscles. Sometimes we see that the groin muscles, the adductor muscle, is much weaker than the abductor muscle, which can predispose to a groin strain or a groin pull. So those are problems that can be identified and prevented. The shoulder is also a, a common injury in, in our younger athletes, usually from contact with the boards. So again, angling properly, knowing how to absorb a hit, mm -hmm. having uh, good quality shoulder pads and elbow pads could make a difference. 
We mentioned a little bit about concussion prevention. Certainly from an equipment standpoint, probably the most effective piece of equipment is full facial protection. When you look at the professional athlete level, the number one injury is facial trauma, usually a laceration, a fracture, unfortunately, even some serious eye injuries. The risk of an eye injury in a sport of ice hockey with a full face mask is zero. There's never been a case of blindness ever from an athlete wearing certified full facial protection. So in that regard, proper equipment certainly can be effective. Any other thoughts on? You know, what comes to mind when we talk about equipment is our skates. It's crucial to our skating mechanics and our technique. Um, so for, for all the parents that are watching and listening, for your young athlete who is still growing, buying a pair of skates to, that they're going to grow in two, three years later, we're doing more damage to the stride than we are good. So there's some really great ways to help get in the proper fitted skate and some little tools and techniques with maybe going from a thicker sock to a thinner sock um, as the athlete grows during the season or over the course of a couple of seasons. But skates, first and foremost, are very, very important when we're thinking about skating mechanics and our technique. Grace, I think you you know you were mentioning just an imbalance, a muscular imbalance. Um, again, so for those of you that tuned in earlier, during the off season, we specifically talked about once someone's out out of season, uh, addressing you know immediate injury, but looking at what did the the art of hockey do to your body? Uh, what kind of imbalances do you have that we then can get rid of? rebuild you so that when you are out and playing in season, you don't have those asymmetrical patterns or muscular imbalances. Now granted, if you're always holding a stick like this, you're holding a stick like this. That's why in season, it's then important to continue to do those corrective type interventions to combat what your body's doing in season and in the sport. So, Great. There's a question about trying to improve that lean muscle mass and strength during the off season, whether it's important to take a supplement like creatine. Yeah, so the best way to improve lean muscle mass or increase lean muscle mass is to have a good training program in place. Uh, that's, that's critical. Um, everyone focuses on protein um, as that uh, source of those building blocks, but it's, you have to look at your entire diet. You need to have you know, those complex carbs in addition to the proteins, the healthy fats, Yes, it can help build lean muscle mass, but again, the emphasis is having a good diet in place, utilizing something like creatine to get over any hurdles that you can't get through through diet alone. Um, the one thing I'll say about creatine is yes, it is, it is an effective supplement, uh, but really we don't advise anyone under the age of 18 to, to use creatine. And if you are to use creatine, again, speak to an expert who can um, give you the right recommendations um, and prescriptions when it comes to uh, usage. Um, and then again, take a look at your training program, your diet, all of those things before even considering something like creatine. That's a good point. And excess in life is probably not a good idea. And some athletes feel that more creatine is better. They're not properly hydrated. There's been problems, of course, with taking too much. So Absolutely. counseling someone like yourself who has expertise in this area would be a good idea. There's a question here about bicycling or riding an exercise bicycle. You see hockey players after games and practices hopping on the bike. Some people have said it can contribute to some hip flexor tightness, which can predispose injury. What's wrong with riding a bike if you're a hockey player? Well. I wouldn't say there's anything necessarily wrong with riding the bike. It's, it's how you're utilizing it. Uh, just the sport itself shortens the hip flexors. Um, so we spend a lot of time in that off season, a lot of time doing, uh, doing some release there to, to kind of get it back to that normal status. Uh, so when you're thinking about why it would be detrimental is we're still shortening the hip flexor. We're deloading some of the system, um, not using any of our stabilizing muscles. Um, but there's some great benefits through riding the bike to get in, as we touched on earlier. Maybe in a 60-minute game, you've only played, you know, uh, about five, six minutes. 
So in order to make sure you've maintained that good energy system, you're doing a bike workout to make sure we're not compounding any injuries with our joints. Um, and at, on the other end of that, maybe you've played that 18 or 20 minutes uh, or, or with some of what we see with our NHL defensemen, maybe upwards in that 30 minutes as we're starting to approach playoff runs and, and getting deep in that playoff is using it as a recovery tool um, <laughs> to help kind of remove some of that lactic acid out of the muscle a little bit um, and prepare yourself then for the following game. Great. That's really important. I'd like to just ask another question about skating analysis. So oftentimes, you know, we can observe skating problems. I have some of my own patients after they've had injury and surgery where we put them on our skating treadmill and with the video analysis we can really pick up some problems that they don't even recognize. It allows us to correct them. So what's the advantage of the 2D video analysis on a skating treadmill that helps you get that athlete back to the most effective stride? Well, the great advantage is we're able to slow that film down so so much that um, what we do is we start videoing from that anterior and that lateral lateral view simultaneously. So we can kind of get a, a very good view of how each incremental portion of your stride is taking place. And if we're, for example, falling in onto our inside edge on our single leg glide on our forward skate. Uh, we know that we're putting extra pressure then on that MCL. We're having a little bit of that valgus positioning. So we're not able to maintain our speed. And that's not something that's that when it's happening so quickly, sometimes it's not able to, you're not able to catch that uh, exact point um, through the human eye. So that video really allows us to say, well, it's coming in at the very beginning of that, of that player stride, or it's really not happening until we're almost at full extension or full propulsion of that opposite leg. So it's a great tool to be able to look at and utilize um, to see how the skater is, is skating, where we can make uh, improvements, and how that plays into the full injury prevention and holding our, our speed. And that, I would say, even just in the weight room, right, you know, and it, again, when I say strength, you know, we hear strength conditioning, and I don't want anyone to think that, you know, that just means performance training, getting under a bell, bar, getting into the weight room. Um, we talk a lot about just moving well. How do you accelerate? How do you change direction? Um, for us, everything's movement, whether you're on the ice, you're on the synthetic you know, ice, or you're on the turf, or you're in the weight room. So the same kind of things that Sean's looking at when someone's in their skating platform, if they have that valgus knee collapse, chances are I'm observing that in some kind of lower extremity squatting type pattern. That's potentially what someone saw on that functional movement screen or assessment that Joe, one of our physical therapists, might do. And so, again, it shows you just the integrity of the, having this multidisciplinary type approach where we can really look at how someone moves as an individual and how that ultimately impacts them in their sport. So That's why we designed our sports medicine centers for movement. That's why we have so much open space. And we have experts who can observe these movement asymmetries and correct them. I think that's a very important point. Plus, video replay is part of every sport now, yeah. Yeah. so it might as well be part of performance training for sport as well. Well, we'd like to thank you all for your time. Uh, we really enjoyed putting on this webinar for you. To learn more about the services we provide for our hockey athletes, there are some uh, websites that you can see on the bottom of the webinar page. Uh, sorry we couldn't get to all the questions here live, but we will review all of them and try to get back to you. Uh, as you can tell, we're very passionate about sport. We're very passionate about, about our patients and our athletes, and we're very passionate about the sport of ice hockey. So thank you, and have a great day.